I'm pleased, Jim. I guess all I can say to you is, you made it. <laughs> we started talking three years ago. Three years ago. This was three Put years. this program this was three together. years in the making. In the making so. <laughs> it's a blockbuster. <laughs> but with COVID and uh, shutdowns and opens and everything, so we finally got it put together. But I'm very excited about it. But Jim is retired as a senior photographer at the University of Pittsburgh. He was also a professor at the Pittsburgh Filmmakers, and he's a research associate at Carnegie Mellon Museum. I'm sorry, Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And he collects 19th century and early 20th century photography. And tonight he'll talk to us about identifying and caring for um, antique photographs. So, Jim? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, been uh, in, in the uh, field of collecting for 40 years. A lot of more, 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 more. That's, that's my wife. She'll tell you. Um, a, a long time. Uh, and while I was at the University of Pittsburgh, I made this. I made it one of my uh to deal with uh, the extensive collection of. Um, of materials in the Hillman Library relating to uh, early uh, media, uh, such as the Pittsburgh City Photographer's Collection, uh, and the Archives of Industrial Society, and I also collaborated with the Fritch Family Archive uh, in the uh, production of uh, catalog for an exhibition called Collecting of the Gilded Age. Uh, I collaborated with the uh, University of Pittsburgh Press on uh, the republication of a landmark book called The Early Architecture. Uh, of Western Pennsylvania, and I also worked extensively with the Stephen Foster Archives at the Center for American Music. Um, so all in all, I feel reasonably well qualified to be here talking to you about pressing the button the right way to get your slide to come up. <laughs> uh, to be talking about photos. I mean, we've all got photos. We've all got them in various uh, ages and in various conditions. Sometimes we actually have them semi-organized in a box in the closet. And sometimes we have them totally unorganized in a shoe box under the bed. <laughs> you might have a collection of albums in a footlocker in the attic. And if you've been uh, saving up your family archives for a long enough period of time, or if you're an aspiring collector, you may have a collection of vintage images. No matter what state you are on this particular line, you are you will benefit from knowing how to identify different kinds of photographs, how to deal with different sorts of, uh, uh, of materials. Uh, we've got a lot of material to cover, and uh, so really, let's get right into it. We're going to start with the timeline of the history of photography. And we start out very, in, in the very beginning uh, with the daguerreotype. That being one of these. The daguerreotype uh, appeared on the scene in 1839. It was the invention of Louis Daguerre uh, and his associate, who never gets any credit, Joseph uh, de Seford Yeps, who had the misfortune of dying before uh, publication of the process. Um, it came to the United States early in 1840 by uh, the auspices of Samuel Morris of, uh, of uh, Morris Code fame. Um, it, it remained a viable commercial process until uh, the uh, early uh, 1860s. We see some examples along the bottom. Uh, I would point out uh, this one here on the left, uh, this picture of a young boy with a curl. And you might look at that and say, young boy, looks like a girl. And I would say, yes, you're exactly right. Uh, but it was, an, it was quite common for parents to dress their male children uh, in clothing that was indistinguishable from girls' clothing until a relatively late age. So it can become problematic to identify gender in some of these early photographs. The accepted way of doing it is by how the hair is parted. Boys' hair tends to be parted on the side. Girls' hair tends to be parted in the center. So if you're uncertain about gender of uh, an unidentified photograph, look at how the hair is parted. Uh, another interesting subgenre of really the hair type is medical photographs, and I would draw your attention to the really spectacular scar uh, on the gentleman's cheek on the right. So 
what is the composition of the garrotype? And the garrotype is a sheet of copper. The garrotype is made of a sheet of copper, which has been silvered on one side, and that silver has been polished to a high state of reflection, to a mirror-like state of reflection. Uh, and the, the next step in the process is to do what's called fuming, where you suspend this plate over a dish of heated iodine. And fumes of iodine rise up and come into contact with the silver plate, and they form uh, a light sensitive compound called silver iodide. This image is then exposed in the camera, and the latent image is developed up by exposing it to a dish of heated mercury. Woo <laughs> boy! The image exists on the surface of the plate as an amalgam of silver and mercury. This is important. It exists on the surface of the plate. What this means is that the daguerreotype uh, is a mind-bendingly fragile thing. If you were to wipe your finger across the surface of the daguerreotype plate, you would actually wipe the surface, wipe the image clean off the plate. It's that fragile. Uh, the other characteristics, the other identifying characteristics of the daguerreotype, the most easily a scene of these, the fact that the surface is so highly reflective. It's a mirror-like surface. You can see yourself in this, in this reflection. There's no, other, there's no other photographic process that looks like a guarantee. <coughs> also, the image is laterally reversed. <coughs> uh, also, uh, another interesting identifying characteristic of the daguerreotype is that it is both positive and negative, depending on how you look at it. If you look at it at a slight angle, it will be negative. If you change that angle, view it becomes positive. So, depending on how you look at it, negative, positive. Because the daguerreotype is such a fragile thing, it has to be delivered in a package. And this package consists of the plate, which bears the image, an overmat, which goes on top of the plate, cover glass, which goes on top of the overmat, and then finally a, a seal, a paper seal. Uh, you can see the seal on this uh, example here is very badly deteriorated uh, and uh, has to be uh, removed uh, and replaced. The package of uh, plate, uh, mat, and cover glass is then bound uh, with uh, something called the preserver, which is a metal foil binder which goes around it, it holds the entire package together. Uh, this package is then inserted into a case to be delivered to the client. The most common type of case uh, is one uh, like this, which is a uh, leatherette over wood, uh, sometimes a, uh, a leatherette over pressed paper. Um, it can also be a product called gutta percha. Uh, which is uh, uh, also known as thermoplastic, uh, which is a, uh, a molded uh, resin which incorporates uh, various organic resins as well as sawdust. You can have fabric cases. Uh, you can also have paper mache cases. In this case, in this instance, you see the example up here is inlaid with um, pearl. They can be quite, uh, they can be quite uh, decorative. As a matter of fact, cases are so interesting to people that there are whole large books written about nothing but heretic cases. There is also a, a small round case, which you see here on the lower left, which is called, for reasons which should really be obvious, an Oreo. <laughs> you also have them in wall frames. Uh, gutta percha being a moldable material uh, lends itself to a variety of shapes and styles, which the, uh, uh, the wooden cases, uh, the open wooden cases, really don't. Uh, <coughs> sizes of the garrotypes are denoted by plate sizes. Right from whole plate, uh, the garrotypes at six and a half by eight and a half inches, uh, to gems. Uh, which are three and a quarter inches by one and a quarter inches. So there's a fairly wide variety of sizes available with the air types. In red, you see the sixth plate uh, at uh, two and three quarters by three and one quarter inches. 
is the most common of the daguerreotype sizes. There are probably more sixth plates produced than any, uh, the, the, any of the other sizes. It's quite common in the world of, uh, of daguerreotypes. Also, you will find that there are alternative presentations in the form of jewelry. We see uh, pins, uh, lockets uh, with a penny per scale, uh, brooches, um, and uh, human hair bracelets. Daguerreotypes, like uh, any other form of early photography, have certain things that are interesting to look for. If you were, if you were, if you want to know a little bit about what's going on with them, or if you're an aspiring collector and you're interested to know what makes things more or less valuable, here are some things to look for. An operator ID. Uh, the operator ID can appear in a variety of places in the, in the daguerreotype. With the example we see in the upper left, it's uh, on the pillow which is the part of the case, when you open it up, the part of the case which is opposite the image is called the pillow. Uh, and here we see Evan Sunbeam Gallery uh, from Philadelphia engraved on the pillow. In the 16th plate uh, uh, image of the gentleman with the stone pipe hat, we can see that the, uh, uh, the uh, name of the operator is stamped on the overmat, Quimby uh, of Broadway. Other things to be on the lookout for are, one of our added is added color. Uh, the types obviously are a, a black and white media, but color was added post-exposure and post-development by means of very, very carefully adding colored powders to the image. So added, added color brings added interest. Uh, note also the larger the large image in the center is a particular subgenre. Uh, of daguerreotype clipping called postmortem photography, uh, which is uh, images, uh, images of the deceased. Postmortem uh, post uh, images are common throughout all of the various types of uh, photography that we will be talking about uh, this evening. Uh, also, things to, things to watch out for are inscriptions and inclusions. This can be very, very helpful for you if you are doing genealogical research. As we see from the example on the left, uh, we have information attached to the outside of the case identifying the person inside as Betsy Marvin Dean, uh, born March 17, 1785, at Ridgefield, Connecticut, died at Spencerport, New York. The second image in is, uh, I, I had this, this image in my collection for many years, but I never paid much attention to it for a couple of reasons. Not a particularly distinguished daguerreotype, and it's got condition issues. But I thought, well, you know, any daguerreotype deserves a little bit of care, so I'm going to take this out of the case. I'm going to give it a good cleaning. And when I took it out of the case, I discovered that there was an inscription in the case. And you'll bear with me if I read it out loud. <laughs> October 4th, 1851, on board the schooner Pensacola. A clipping in the case that reads, I love thee still, though time may print its furrows on my brow, and steal the roses from those cheeks and form the same fresh I love thee even when you, youth has fled, and thy fair charms have flown. I love thee still in future years, as in those days now. And then a handwritten passage below that, which reads, Read this when I am no more, and say, Have I not kept thee above sacred? Have I not loved you even unto death? And that's what it means. <laughs> that's what it means. Even a subordinary daguerreotype, it raises it up. It's an inscription, an inclusion. On the far right, there's another interesting one. It says, Emler, um, Emler Davis, his curl. <laughs> so the inclusions can be very interesting things to find. Uh, problems with the daguerreotype. There, there are myriad problems. 
uh, most commonly you will find the tarnish. It's a it's a silver based it's a silver based product, and it's going to tarnish like any other piece of silver. And this is something that happens uh, to garretites where the seal has been compromised. It's either deteriorated or it's missing, and it allows air to penetrate into the case and promotes the formation of tarnish. Uh, scratches. <coughs> The daguerreotype plate, as I mentioned, is eye-wateringly fragile. Anything that uh, anything that's going to come in contact with the plate is going to leave a scratch on it. It's almost it's almost to the point where you really can't even touch them. Mold mold will grow in places where uh, storage has been uh, less than optimum. Uh, and lastly, bad glass. Uh, bad glass is a is a term which covers uh, dirt. Uh, on the glass, and also a phenomenon called weeping, uh, where the glass begins a process of chemical deterioration and begins to precipitate out an oily, uh, an oily fluid. Um, and that can, if you're not careful, it can actually grip on the plate of the type. So if you have the garretypes, each when you store them, you should store them so that the, uh, uh, the image side is up and the glass side is down. So if you do develop weeping glass, it's not going to weep on your garretype. Now, <clears throat> solutions, You'll, it's, there's blank, no, no solutions to be had. Um, they're, the nature of the fragile daguerreotype is such that you, you really can't do anything with it. There are, there are certain processes which can be uh, employed, uh, and certain things which have been tried over the years, almost all of which have proven deleterious to the nature of the daguerreotype in the long run. It's got too many downsides. So there's not really much you can do. One thing you can do is clean the glass or replace the glass if it's weeping. If your glass is dirty, you can clean it. If your glass is weeping, you can replace it. Uh, but this is not something that should be done by somebody who doesn't have a real serious amount of experience doing it because the plate is so easily damaged. You don't want to try to do this yourself. You want to find somebody who can do it for you who knows what you're doing. You can see the difference glass cleaning can make. Uh, this particular kind of daguerreotype, by the way, with a white ring around it, is called a magic circle daguerreotype. And it was created using a, a, a process of multiple exposure to get this, uh, to get to get the uh, magic circle. We move on from the daguerreotype process to uh, to deal with the wet plate, the various wet plate processes. Uh, the wet plate process was developed in 1851 by the lamentable Frederick Scott Archer. Uh, I say lamentable because poor Mr. Archer, despite the, the uh, outrageous success of the process he devised, never made any effort to profit from it, never patented it, never claimed it in any way, shape, or form. And as a result, died destitute. So therefore, he is lamentable. Um, the problem: there are a variety of problems with the daguerreotype which we've covered, including the fact that they're fragile. Uh, they're also unique. There's only one, only one of each. Uh, unless it was taken with something called a multiplying camera, which created numerous exposures on the same plate. Uh, each daguerreotype image is a one-off. Uh, the wet plate process was called that because of the, the, the complexity of the process. Uh, it's a liquid emulsion on a rigid support uh, uh, over which an emulsion is flowed. And this emulsion consists of silver nitrate in a solution called collodion. Uh, and collodion is um, cellulose uh, nitrate dissolved in ether. So it's pretty volatile. Um, and so you had to create this solution you had to flow the solution over the plate that you were going to expose, put it in a plate holder, put it in the camera, expose it, take it out, take it back into your dark tent, develop it all before it dried, which was usually within about 15 minutes. So you had to be speedy. You had to know what you were doing. It was a complex and difficult process. The major, the major varieties of the wet plate process include the ambrotype uh, and the tin type, and we'll deal with each of these uh, separately. Uh, the ambrotype is a is a wet plate uh, process where the substrate is is glass. 
um, and this glass, this negative is, uh, and that's what it is, it's the creation of the negative, is slightly underexposed, and then backed with some black backing material, paper, cloth, um, a, a piece of glass with, with uh, 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 varnish on it, sometimes a piece of black metal, any kind of black backing behind an underexposed negative will cause it to appear as a positive. Um, these images are much less brilliant than the Daguerreotype. Uh, they have a, a subtle three-dimensional character to them, depending on the angle of view as you look at them. You can sometimes almost see under, under the plate. Um, it is in a package very similar uh, to the Daguerreotype, uh, although oftentimes they don't have a cover glass. Sometimes amortites don't bother, they dispense with the cover glass. Um, this is a disassembled package. Uh, this is the image as it looks. This is the case it was in. Uh, the negative quality of, uh, uh, of the image can be seen on the lower left. The dark backing material here was a piece of uh, glass with varnish. The overmat uh, and the uh, preserver made up uh, the package. Problems associated with the amber type are, uh, are reasonably common across the spectrum of early images. They get dirty. The emulsion degrades. If you look the, at the image in the center, note uh, around the periphery of the image this kind of bluing uh, that occurs. This is a, uh, a process called silvering out. Um, and it's something that we will uh, address a little bit further on. Uh, we move down the road here. There's also crazy and flaking of the emulsion. Uh, and you can have deteriorated and missing backing. Uh, if you have missing backing, that's relatively easy to repair. All you need to do is find some sort of material which you can use to then back the image so that it again appears positive. Uh, as a point of distinction, I would ask you to pay attention to the image in the center uh, that has the uh, patriotic map. Uh, notice the flags. Uh, in the upper left and right corners, uh, the drums and the artillery piece in the lower left, right and left uh, corners, and the slogan, the Union, United Forever, uh, has a banner across the bottom. That's an interesting map, an interesting patriotic map. The other uh, major variety of the wet plate process was the tin type. And in, the, in a tintype, what you have is uh, a, uh, a wet plate emulsion, a liquid emulsion on a sheet of black Japan iron. There is no tin in a tintype. These images tend to be quite dark uh, relative to either the amperotype uh, or uh, the hair type. They tend to be dark, the contrast level tends to be low. Uh, they were uh, extremely popular uh, during the Civil War years. You, you find a lot, of, uh, a lot of military imagery such as you see here. Also here on the left you have an example of what's known as an occupational image where you have two men, roofers with their roofing hammers uh, and musicians with uh, their horns. And what was some of my favorite things. The late 19th century, the late 19th century was the golden age of wacky hairdos and extravagant hats. <laughs> and you will find wacky hairdos and extravagant hats everywhere in amongst tin types and other forms of, uh, of early uh, photography. Uh, the tin type had the longest lifespan of any of the early processes. It was uh, a period of the 1850s in there, in some places you can still get tin types made as commercial enterprises up into the 1950s. Uh, and in fact, there are still people who are making tin types as well as uh, beer types uh, today. Uh, but these are primarily niche uh, operators uh, performing their work uh, for the sake of art rather than commerce. Uh, these 
images were offered in a variety of ways. You would oftentimes see them cased, uh, although there is no practical need for a tin type to appear in a case. The uh, sentiment was to make the, uh, the aesthetics uh, of the daguerreotype and the ambrotype. So people would, operators would uh, deliver um, uh, images in case form. These tend to be somewhat earlier. Uh, you have the paper mats, uh, folders, uh, and also loose uh, tintypes. Uh, loose, loose tintypes are oftentimes fugitives from albums. What are the sizes of a tintype? Boy, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> Uh, tin types were often cut from uh, larger uh, sheets of, of metal. You would have a multiplying camera which would make several images at once, or you would have a multiplying camera which would make different images, and then the operator would cut them out. Uh, and it, 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 my, my experience suggests that uh, people who were doing the trimming here had very, very rudimentary understanding of the concept of parallel images. <laughs> I can tell you, however, that they were available in a wide variety of sizes, the smallest being something called a gem, which is uh, three and a quarter by one and a quarter inches, um, or three quarters by one and a quarter inches. In this image, which is in a paper mat, the tintype is the dark spot in the center. <laughs> On the other extreme, there was the elephant. <laughs> or the imperial. So you could have this, or you could have this. Tin types all. On the far uh, right, you have an extreme example where the image has been entirely snipped from its surrounding metal. Just, they just cut it out like a paper doll. Um, on this image on, on the right is the cutout on the left is three men in Indian regalia. And I am convinced that these are members of a fraternal organization called the Improved Order of Red Men. The Improved Order of Red Men is a fraternal organization which still exists, although it is a whole heck of a lot smaller than it used to be. Uh, members of the Improved Order of Red Men would dress up in Indian regalia. What are the problems with, uh, go ahead, Betty, go ahead and laugh. Can I, can I share your story? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, bending. Since a daguerreotype, or since a, a tintype is on a sheet of thin iron, it's subject to bending. And I have a dear friend, a dear friend, <laughs> who, rooting, rooting around in her grandparents' attic, yeah, grandparents' attic, found a tintype and thought that it would be a good idea to fold it in half. <laughs> I was a child. You were a child. That's hardly an excuse. Um, so they can, they're easily, they're easily bent. Um, and they're, since once again, since they're iron, uh, they're prone to rusting um, and bubbling. Bubbling is a, uh, as you see in this image here, um, usually indicative of um, rust under the emulsion. And then you have a problem with the emulsion just flaking off. Um, sometimes it's difficult to determine, it, uh, particularly if it's cased, whether or not it's a tin type or an amber type or what have you. But I can tell you one of the easiest ways to know is that since tin types are iron, they're attracted by a magnet. There could also be a problem with confusion. There's a, there's a process out there which looks a whole heck of a lot like a tintype. And the reason it looks a whole heck of a lot like a tintype is because it uses essentially the same process. What's different is the substrate on which the emulsion is spread. And these are called panotypes. Uh, and panotypes can be uh, uh, on, on sheets of heavy paper, although to be truthful with you, they are most commonly seen on leather. So it's a photographic image on a piece of leather. But 
It won't pass the magnet. So a tintype is only on metal. A tintype is only on metal. Mm -hmm. Only on black. Can you take it from the tintype and put it on paper? You could do a copy. Thanks to what you're out for. Um, identification. Uh, people started to, uh, to, to sort of write their names on them, identify them. Sarah Wiley on the left. Uh, your cousin J.D. Kirk. Um, uh, in the center, we have a tintype of Fred Day. And Fred Day's name has been actually scratched into the plate. Uh, and this drives me mad, along with, along with all my other uh, friends and, and colleagues who are in the genealogy where you have only the first names, Mac or May, May and Melba. <laughs> May and Melba who? I want to know. They're eating ice cream. I know. They're only May and Melba. They're lost otherwise. You also see with the uh, advent of, uh, of the tintype, particularly those delivered in, in paper folders like this, the, advertise, the advent of advertising. Uh, what are known as uh, photographer's back marks. Uh, D. Filson, photographer of Arkham Street, opposite Concord House, three doors west of New Court, of uh, the, the New Court House, Steubenville, Ohio. And one of my favorites, right next to it, which reads, Hurrah for P.B. Oakley's picture car, <laughs> where you can get the best pictures for the least money. <laughs> Secure the shadow area. That's market. We also see two different examples of back marks from the same photographer, uh, T.M. Sarman uh, of Morristown. This can sometimes be helpful in dating. If you're doing, if you're doing genealogy, you may be able to track down uh, the dates that particular images were made by the kinds of advertising that appears in the back. Uh, things to watch out for, uh, things that make daguerreotype or tintypes, I should say, extra interesting. Uh, you start to see a, a novelties, which you didn't see before. The earlier, earlier processes took themselves really seriously. Uh, but with tintypes, you start to see the, uh, some novelty material, uh, like, this, uh, like the photo on the, on the far left here with the gentleman clenching his buttocks <laughs> for the camera. Uh, next to him, you have a, 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 a tintype that was probably made at a carnival, where you have a man in a, in a swell derby peering over a cutout or appearing to be riding on a donkey. Um, you also have, uh, as I've mentioned before, occupational photographs of people in, uh, applying their trade or wearing, wearing a, the uniform of their trade, what have you. Uh, you have uh, elaborate uh, backdrops. Niagara Falls is very popular as a backdrop material. You have military, you have uh, uh, medical. Uh, you also have a, a particular subcategory called the hidden mother. And the hidden mother, the, what the photographer is attempting to do is to employ the services of a parent to restrain their squirming toddler <laughs> so that they aren't blurred during the exposure. Most photographers were very discreet about this. You have people hidden. You uh, in the periphery or behind, uh, behind something uh, the, in an attempt to kind of minimize uh, the appearance of this helper trying to hold their armor still. But there, there was, there's always a case when something doesn't quite happen the way you want it to. Uh, you, you get frustrated and I can hear this photographer saying, here, we'll hide you under this drape. I assure you, madam, <laughs> nobody will ever notice. <laughs> and if you look carefully, you can see that this hidden parent was not particularly successful <laughs> because the, the toddler is still a squirming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, following up, uh, the next step in line is a process called the carte de visite. Carte de visite. Uh, French for visiting cards, uh, appeared in 1854. Uh, they're known also uh, by the simple abbreviation CDB. Uh, the CDB was hugely popular. 
1859 onwards up through about 1870 and produced a fad called carnomania. Uh, this took advantage of the fact that you could have multiple images made from the negative. Uh, you could also have multiplying cameras, which would produce uh, 6, 8, 10, 12, uh, two dozen uh, images of a single exposure. And you would have these cards in your vest pocket or in your bag, whenever you went to visit somebody. And when you entered the house, you would take the card and drop it in a basket in the parlor, or perhaps in the vestibule, the visiting card. It was hugely popular. And the popularity of the card to visit gave birth to the photo album. This is the first of a number of teases <laughs> about the photo album. Really. Uh, the card to visit is about the size of a playing card. Um, it is a, uh, uh, an image uh, to uh, uh, roughly two inches by three and a half. Uh, mounted on the card size, two and a half inches by four. And uh, it was, uh, these were what were called albumin prints. Albumin prints are the first commercially exploitable method of producing a photographic print from a negative. And what you've got is a, a paper base uh, which has held onto a photographic emulsion, silver nitrate emulsion. Uh, it bound up in egg whites. Um, chemicals, uh, the, the, the albumin print uh, became the dominant form of photographic positives almost up until the beginning of the 20th century. And they, the photographic industry was also the largest consumer of eggs in the country. Uh, problems here that are, are similar to many others uh, that we've talked about. Things get dirty. Uh, things fade. And one of the reasons they fade is because you've got, a, you've got a photograph attached to a piece of cardboard. A piece of cardboard is a nasty thing uh, in relationship to a photograph because it has, it's full of acids. <coughs> and acids cause fading. Uh, you also have the potential for tearing. Uh, and if the image has been stored in any kind of damp environment, sometimes you get a separation between the card uh, and the photograph that's resting on it. Uh, you'll, notice, uh, you'll notice also right directly there in the center is a particular problem called incompetence. Um, and as happens so often when there's a gravy train rolling, people want to get on it who aren't necessarily qualified to do it. So you will find people who just get it so wrong, it's hard to see from where you were sitting, but on that image in the center, the man's hair, his eyebrows, his mustache, and his beard all had to be drawn in by pencil because the photographer didn't get it quite right. Uh, the things to watch out for tend to be similar as we go along. We have the hidden mother, which we discussed previously, uh, medical issues, occupational uh, images, uh, and then identification. In this place, uh, uh, we have a, a gentleman in civilian clothes who is actually General McCook of the Union Army. Other things to watch out for, back marks, uh, ad advertising, as I mentioned previously. Uh, you also have the appearance of tax stamps. Tax stamps appear on uh, carte de visite, uh, also on tin types. And these tax stamps uh, were a fundraising device to help finance the uh, union's civil war effort. The tax stamp uh, um, act came into effect in, uh, June, on June 30, 1863 as a luxury task on, quote, photographs, ambrotypes, daguerreotypes, or any other sun pictures. Uh, they were also a, uh, a tax which was applied to a variety of other items as well, but in this context, I'm just going to think about it in terms of the like, being on the back of the seats. Also, if you look on the far right over there, we have a back mark from a photographer from, again, from Morristown, VA, 
uh, called J.L. Cope, J.L. Cope photographer. And uh, J.L. might not have been really convinced of his ability to make a living as a photographer since he also chose to advertise his side gig uh, as a tire of artificial flies. <laughs> You also begin to see new and different things here uh, that are related to the nature of the uh, cartoon scene as something uh, of which you could make many, 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 many multiple copies. Uh, amongst those are the appearance of mass market carts to uh, including uh, on both uh, uh, this image and this image, uh, sideshow performers, people who, who perform for Barner or uh, or any of the other circuses uh, and, and sideshows. We have uh, uh, David Navarro, the uh, Illinois Giant, who performed as the Illinois Giant Boy, uh, and dwarves, uh, uh, the Marquise Volga and the Marquesa Louise. Uh, Honest Long Cut Tobacco is an advertising card, an advertising card of disease. Uh, and especially in the Civil War era, in the immediate post Civil War era, Parts, the commercially produced cards, cards de visite uh, of uh, prominent Indian generals. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, David Navarro, the Illinois giant boy, has a particularly poignant Pittsburgh connection. Um, Navarro was a part of a, a, an extended exhibit of living curiosities um, at Harris Mammoth Sixth Street Museum in Pittsburgh uh, in 1882 that included the bearded lady and the tallest man and woman on earth. It was during that time here uh, that Navarro fell in love with these 16 year old Carrie Glenn Denning uh, of um, Allegheny, the then Allegheny PA. Navarro and Glenn Denning fell in love and Navarro proposed. However, the parents of David Navarro and the parents of Carrie Glenn Denning did not approve. As a result, David Navarro went on strike. He refused to perform and took himself off to his trailer. Unfortunately, while he was there, he caught smallpox and died. Buried in the Evie Dale Cemetery in Boston. Cabinet cards, the next step in the process. Cabinet cards appeared uh, in uh, 1870. Uh, when the gravy trains are rolling, people don't want to see it slow down. And the gravy train created by the cart that was even starting to slow down by this period of time. And so the people say, well, what can we do? sort of keep this keep this enterprise going. And in a typical American fashion, the reply was, well, we'll make it bigger. <laughs> so what we've got here is essentially an image which has the same aspect ratio uh, as uh, uh, as cards to the uh, but is is bigger. Bigger. Uh, four and four by six and quarter inches. There are interesting things to see in the world of, uh, of cabinet cards. One of them is the fact that people started to employ masking, uh, where your image would appear inside some you know, some uh, elaborate uh, construction, which was placed over the image before it was produced. Uh, you also continue to see occupationals, uh, and including a very rare and unusual occupation of the woman uh, as, as cleaning. Also novelties, two boys, two boys in a boat. Uh, and a, a really mysterious one here on the lower, on the lower right, where you've got six guys doing six different things, including pointing a gun, uh, holding onto his vest, uh, holding on to some tools, wearing a So there's a mystery there, which I would really like to know about. Uh, also during the, uh, during the, a cabinet card. You begin to see new kinds of paper introduced, 
Whereas previously, uh, you had albumin prints, which had this sort of characteristic, warm, uh, almost seedy feeling to them. You now begin to see new kinds of paper, including gelatin bromide type papers, which had a significantly different look uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the photos. Um, things to watch out for occupationals. This particular occupational has a, a, a long note on the back um, uh, to writing to people at home from somebody who moved away and is writing at home and telling them about how, how tough times are in their new uh, location. Uh, you also have uh, the post of a postmortem uh, cabinet card. Uh, the postmortem persists across all of the different situations. <laughs> A particularly unusual still life of four potatoes. <laughs> and once again, there's a story there. I'd really like to know it, but four potatoes it will remain. And then finally, a, uh, 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 on the far uh, right hand side, we have a, a commercially produced uh, uh, cabinet card of sideshow performers known as uh, Wingo and Coltano, the wild men. <laughs> Cabinet cards and cards to disease share the same kinds of condition issues. They, they get dirty, they can separate, uh, they can get torn. Oh, another teaser for albums. <laughs> photo albums appeared in the late 1850s, as I mentioned, in response to Cardomania. Uh, they ranged in size uh, from Albums, albums kind of like this. Uh, although the green one over on the far right is a V album. A v album about two inches square, designed to hold gem tin types. Uh, with the advent of cabinet cards, uh, albums which started out relatively small became larger more elaborate, uh, including card fabric covers, uh, cases uh, or albums with music boxes built in, um, cellul albums with celluloid, co excuse me, celluloid covers, uh, which produce, uh, or which all sometimes included very, very beautiful and very colorful uh, front pages, as you see here. Eventually, they, they became designed to hold cabinet cards, cards to disease, as well as tin types. Uh, the last example you see there uh, on the far right uh, incorporates a stand for, for viewing, as well as a drawer uh, and a base designed to hold additional uh, cabinet cards. Albums pose a serious dilemma for the concern. A real serious problem. I'll get into it later. <laughs> uh, negatives. Uh, dry plate glass negatives appear in 1871. And this this actually marks the beginning of amateur photography. Uh, previously, any of the processes that you were involved in were extremely complex, requiring you more than a little knowledge and more than a little manual dexterity to get the job done. It was not something that promoted spontaneity or doing something on the spur of the moment. However, with the advent of dry plates, you no longer had to deal with uh, that 15 minute window of opportunity to get your wet plate negative made. You can simply go down to the store and step up to the counter and say, Wash dry plates, my good man. And you could take it home and expose it and develop it whatever you want. This really marks the beginning. 1871 of amateur photography. Here we see some examples. Uh, over here on the far left, we have uh, scans of the negative and then a positive rendering of it. Uh, an image that I'd like to refer to as the reluctant chaperone, where you've got a young woman peering between the trees and pointing down at this couple below her who were enjoying a little smooching. You also see people beginning to experiment at home. 
uh, with multiple exposures where you've got a, a semi-transparent figure in a, in a drape emulating a ghost uh, next to somebody being from Over on the far right is an interesting image because it has no quad connection. Uh, I bought uh, at an auction uh, a few years ago a collection of material attributed to a family in you know, an unnamed family. You know, I wish there were more information. I only have about half the information I really need to be sure about it. Uh, but I, I'm reasonably certain that the, this photo was taken by somebody who was an electrical engineer. Uh, maybe it was in a box of material I bought were interleaved with sheets of paper that had Westinghouse Electric Company letterhead on it. Uh, and one of the places they visited when they were in Germany there was the Siemens electrical plant. Uh, this particular glass plate image is of a, uh, a, a location in uh, Wuppertal, Germany. Uh, and it is the Wuppertal Schwebebahn. Wuppertal Schwebebahn. Uh, the Wuppertal Schwebebahn is an elevated railway that has the car suspended beneath the track rather than riding on top of it. So what are the problems that are associated with glass plate negatives? Well, we're going to talk about sizes first. <laughs> uh, standards, standard sizes, these were commercially manufactured things. So they came in standard sizes, three and a quarter by four and a quarter, four by five, five by seven, and eight by ten. Uh, the problem is they don't respond well to careless handling. <laughs> they don't like to be dropped. Other problems include, uh, along with uh, dirt uh, and grime attached to the plate, a problem which I mentioned previously in the context of amprotypes called silvering out. Uh, and silvering out or silver mirroring is a blue metallic sheen which will appear uh, on the, uh, uh, the negative. Um, it will also appear on positive prints. And uh, generally this appears uh, in the shadow areas of the image first and then expanding into the midtone and highlight values as well. Um, it is associated with poor storage and atmospheric pollution. Uh, you also have physical degradation uh, along the third of grime. The emulsion begins to flake off, uh, separate uh, from the uh, glass plate. This is particularly true if you find that you have stored your, uh, stored your glass plates inappropriately in areas that are too damp. Uh, not much that can be done about that. There's no getting back from, from that. Uh, dirt and grime, however, can be addressed because the glass plate can be cleaned. But it can only be cleaned on one side. Glass plates have two sides. They have a base side and an emulsion side. The base side is just a piece of glass, just a piece of plate glass. The other side, the emulsion side, is the side which carries the image. And you can clean the base side using warm water and a, a mild soap. The question is, how do you identify which side is which? Base side is very reflective. Since all it is is a piece of glass, you're going to see reflections in it very clearly. The emulsion side, since it carries, uh, since it carries an emulsion and, and, and a chemical, uh, has a chemical nature, is not going to be very reflective. So if you can identify the base side from the emulsion side, you can clean the base side. You cannot clean the emulsion side. Oh, flexible base negatives. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> you know what this means, don't you? It means I get to flash the danger sign. <laughs> I trade negatives. Oh, these are nasty, nasty things. I trade negatives. Base on the nitrate negative is made out of, as the name suggests, cellulose nitrate. The same thing that's used to create metallic charges for artillery shells. <laughs> Which gives you some idea of how dangerous they can be. And there's nothing you can 
do to avoid the problems that they create. So in those nitrate negatives are doomed in the moment of their creation. There's nothing you can do to hold it back. There's nothing you can do uh, to, uh, to stop it. You can, you can retard it, you can slow down the pace uh, of destruction, but you can't halt it. It's going bad no matter what you do. The fact that it's, you can't do anything about it going bad, they are also highly combustible. Highly combustible. Under the right conditions, they will spontaneously combust. Sometimes they will spontaneously combust so energetically that you might consider it an explosion. What are those conditions, Jim? Everybody wants to know. Um, it occurs mostly with cellulose nitrate based motion picture films, films that are contained in a can. Oh, by the way, they'll also burn under water since oxygen is a byproduct of combustion. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> they'll burn you down and blow you up. But that's not the worst thing. The worst thing is much more subtle than insidious. And that is that as cellulose nitrate negatives deteriorate, they produce outgassing or offgassing that will severely damage surrounding materials, paper materials, other negatives, pretty much anything that's close to or in touch with them. Uh, you can see two examples of that here provided by the Chicago Well Human Works. There are generally recognized to be five specific stages of cellulose nitrate deterioration, starting out with level number one, which is no apparent deterioration. And it progresses through level number two, where they start to yellow a little bit. Level number three is where people think, begin, people who are not hit for what's going on with cellulose nitrate begin to notice that something's wrong. Uh, and that's because they emit a strong and noxious odor uh, of uh, nitric acid. This is also sometimes known as uh, vinegar syndrome. And then it proceeds through level four. Uh, level five, uh, soft, uh, they, can, they can stick to the material until finally you reach the very end where you've got nothing but a high brown acidic powder. Here are examples of nitrate deterioration in 35 millimeter negatives. It's what the roll of film looks like when these are scanned to show these tendrils of deterioration uh, in, in the scans of this 35 millimeter nitrate material. How do you know if you've got a nitrate? Well, there are a couple of ways. Uh, most often, the images were marked nitrate. That's a, that's a dead giveaway. <laughs> but that's not often the case. Sometimes they don't. Or you may see a negative which is marked safety film. Safety film is uh, an acetate base, but as you can see, just because it's a safety film, it doesn't mean it's got to keep from deteriorating. I'm going to show you a sort of seat in the pants test for nitrate negatives. So I just happen to have one of these nasty pills right here in this envelope. I'm going to take this out and I'm going to put it in my hand. And I want you to watch very carefully what's going to happen. See a curl? The longer I hold it there, the warmer it gets. This is a good seated pants test for whether or not the negative you have is a cellulose nitrate negative. As it cools off, we'll find out again. This very useful information comes from the Northeast Document Conservation Center and shows the end year of production for various nitrate-based uh, materials. Uh, X-ray films, 1933. Roll films from 35 millimeter, 1938. Portrait and commercial sheet films, 
1939, aerial films, 1942, film pack, 1949, roll films in medium format size, that would be this size, uh, 616, 620, and so forth, 1950. Why is that in red? Why is that in red? Anyone speculate? So that's what most people would combine. That's very, very close, my boy. That's my son, I can call him my boy. <laughs> if you have negatives in this format at home that date from a period close to or preceding 1950, chances are way better than even that they're cellulose nitrate negatives. can't emphasize this too much. You cannot store these materials safely. They are too dangerous to have around. Even large institutions with big endowments have a hard time dealing with the storage of nitrate-based materials. The conventional archive of uh, uh, Procedure, the most widely accepted archival procedure for dealing with nitrate-based materials today is to make the best possible scan you can and then destroy the original. Sorry to say that, but it's just the way it is. You can't do it, there's just too many downsides. It'll ruin your stuff, it'll burn you down, it'll blow you up. Modern day. This is the Kodak camera, serial number 540. Um, in, the, uh, in the year 1880, the original Kodak came out and it sold for $25. For $25, you got a camera, a spiffy leather carrying case, and a loaded with film enough to make 100 exposures. When those 100 exposures were done, you would send the entire camera back to Kodak, where they would strip the film out, process the, uh, process the film, uh, uh, reload the camera with enough ex film for another 100 exposures and then send it back to the long press. They marketed this nifty thing under the uh, slogan, you press the button and we do the rest. <laughs> another example of fine marketing. Note, note that it was not Eastman Kodak Company, it was the Eastman Dry Cut Film the roll film, the roll film Kodak came out uh, early enough so that there was a lot of sort of cross uh, utilization between uh, tin types and uh, the roll film camera. If you look at this uh, nifty tin type of these two men, uh, you can see that the gentleman on the uh, uh, on the left is holding a Kodak camera in his lap. So, with the introduction of the first Kodak roll film, we actually come into the modern era. This brings, us, this brings us up essentially to what we would generally recognize as today. Um, and you have, a, you have a, a number of uh, kinds of images that are uh, specific to this kind of stuff. One of them being real photo postcards. Uh, starting in 1902, Kodak offered a photographic paper which on the reverse had a split back and a place to put a postage stamp so that you can put a photograph on it and send it through the mail. They are known generically as real photo postcards, oftentimes abbreviated simply as RPPC, real photo postcards. Uh, this split back print paper was produced by Kodak up into the, uh, into the late 1980s. I've sent many a postcard through the mail myself. Here are some examples, Niagara Falls background, um, you see, the, you see the split back, this one has a date on it, 1911. Uh, a French real photo postcard showing a gentleman uh, uh, posing with his uh, Renault 6 CD. I put this one up uh, because I think it's of particular interest in that it shows the, uh, it shows the prevalence of the swastika symbol uh, before it was appropriated by the Nazis. It was a, cross-cultural symbol of peace and good luck. And here you see it on this, this hat. 
I'd like to think of, without the benefit of there's any evidence, that this is a New Year's one. <coughs> Uh, you could get you could get uh, real photo postcards from from studios. What you see here on the left in the center, you can see an example of something that somebody might make while they were at home, where you have a confused woman sitting on the stoop while two guys do guy stuff for her. <laughs> and a particularly fun one over on the far right uh, that might have that was a novelty image uh, that might have been taken at a carnival or fair. Um, you also uh, begin to see in this uh, uh, era, the modern era, what are known as card-mounted photos. Card-mounted photos are, are photos like, like this one. The, the name is self-explanatory. It's a photo mounted on a piece of cardboard. However, very, very interesting sources of, of, of particularly nifty images. Uh, they showed us how we worked. Uh, this group photograph from uh, Elliott Steel Mill No. 6, dated June 25, 1913, or this other one, but also a card mounted photograph uh, from the Capel Fan and Engineering Company of Monongahela City, PA. Note, if you would please, third from the left in the first row, an example of how we used to send children to work in heavy industry. Uh, they would also show us how we got uh, around by stern wheeler, how we dressed whenever we were going down and working the mines, what we did for entertainment, the Palmateer Sisters Orchestra, a touring ensemble of sisters, valuable keepsakes brought over from the old country, and a couple of women in Indian regalia. Here we are again. These uh, are uh, card mounted photographed portraits, uh, exquisitely hand painted portraits uh, of the daughters of Pittsburgh, well, uh, Pittsburgh industrialist Henry Holdship. Uh, Henry Holdship, uh, it should be noted, was a, a primary figure in the uh, sports club um, in which held the dam, which collapsed, which flooded Johnson. Snapshots. Now we're now we're right here. We've got it, we've got it all. Showing off the new student baker, a, uh, a a fun self portrait. Yours, yours truly, watching television. <laughs> um, they mark uh, the commonplace moments in our lives. They are oftentimes poo pooed by serious critics of photography, uh, but I would maintain that any serious critic of photography who poo poos the snapshot has never had his emotion hijacked by finding a box of photographs in their father's attic when they were cleaning out. Um, this, this brings us to the, to the approaching the end here. Thank you, um, Which is issues of, issues of preservation in the modern era. Um, for both analog and digital material, I can't leave you get out of this room without talking about digital material. Uh, and this is where we finally get to talk about albums. <laughs> I've teased you enough. Um, albums, uh, albums are hostile environments for photographs. There's an interesting quote here from Douglas Severson, who uh, uh, was uh, chairman of the uh, photography group of the American Institute of Conservation in an article uh, in the New York Times in 1987 stated that in some albums, photographs are ruined much more quickly than they would if you just left them in a shoebox. It's in the nature of albums, of the type that we are most familiar with, that they ruin photographs through the acidic content of their pages. The dilemma arises when you have something like this, where you have an album which has been heavily annotated uh, by the person who put it together. 
Photographs can be held into these kinds of albums by, uh, uh, by uh, photo corners, these little black photo corners, or they can, if you're really a, a portrait, you can, they can be glued in. If they're glued in, you're not going to take them out without destroying the uh, material. Um, the problem comes from the paper that they're on. Uh, this uh, almost uh, uh, craft paper like, uh, or construction paper like material, as it ages, begins to develop all of the uh, uh, suppleness and flexibility of the tension. And it, it leaks acid, leaches acid uh, into the prints. Bad for them. Magnetic page albums. I would venture to say that everybody sitting in this room has a magnetic page album somewhere at home. And they are awful, 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 awful things for photography. They stain the print with the, the, those adhesive rows on the back, eventually transfer the back the photograph, and then eventually bleed through the front. Uh, they promote uh, uh, fading and physical damage. They're, they're horrible, absolutely horrible things to keep photographs in. So what do you do? The solution to a lot of the problems that we've talked about up to this point comes down to the question of storage and handling. How do you store these things? Well, some rules, some basic rules. They should be in a place that is not too hot and does not have wide temperature storms. It should be in a place that's not too humid. <laughs> what does that mean? That means you can't keep it in the attic and you can't keep it in the basement. These pho your photographs have to live where you live. This is an example of what could happen to a color print that's been stored uh, unattended in an attic for 20 years. This kind of fading, uh, this kind of mold growth is caused by uh, storage in a damp environment. And yes, it, that is you. <laughs> Proper archival storage materials are not these things. These will not do. Shoebox under the bed, a magnetic page album, won't work. Daguerreotypes, another, no, what do you store them in? What do you store this stuff in? Daguerreotypes, another case of images, should be kept in archival boxes. Parts of the tin types, loose images, plate negatives that should be stored in mylar, archival paper sheet the sleeves, and stored in archival boxes. Non-nitrate roll film and sheet film negatives should be stored in archival sleeves and the sleeves kept in archival binders. I should mention, not these. <laughs> you say, well, you still I gotta keep these things in binders, that means I'm gonna run off the target, I'm gonna get myself a gross of uh, 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 three reminders. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. These things outgas in ways that are unhealthy for Photos. Give it a, pick, pick one up and give it a smell. If it smells like plastic, you don't want it. Snapshots and other family photos that are in albums uh, can be removed from the deficient albums that they're stored in and stored in archival sound albums. Where do you get this stuff? Uh, these are vendors, uh, Gaylord Archival. Uh, Hollinger Metal Edge, uh, University Products, these are all three uh, uh, vendors of, uh, of this kind of uh, material. Um, and a quick uh, search will lead you to their online catalogs. Um, all is not lost, however. Uh, in, in the modern day, we have the ability to, to purchase really capable scanners and software products that will allow us to uh, do uh, restorations, digital restorations of faded, uh, faded materials. Sometimes you, using a process as simple as a click of a button. Sometimes a little bit more complex in the lower, the lower photo, you see a card mounted, a card mounted photograph split down the middle. Uh, that's actually in my grandfather's baseball team. Uh, 
visually reassembled and color added just for fun. So if you're going to digitize an album, there's a workflow that you should follow. You should be very organized about this because you don't want to lose the context of how the thing is organized. This is, this is my workflow. Uh, I make a low resolution scan of each page of an album. And I give that uh, scan a name which identifies it uh, as to which album it's from and what page it is. This particular scan, for example, is called album number one, page 14. And it has the um, the further annotation is 001, which indicates that it's a scan of the whole page. And then go in and scan each individual image. I'll make high resolution scans of each individual image on the page. Naming it appropriately so that you don't use context. I'm going to close up now with the question of digital issues. I know this is a historical society, and I know we've been talking about the 19th century, but I would be remiss if I uh, didn't deal with uh, some of these issues as well. Uh, digital images aren't things as, as we normally associate with them. Associate with them. Uh, they are, I like to think of them as bags of ones and zeros, which exist in the machine somewhere. This bag of ones and zeros uh, that lives in that machine, and it depends on that machine for you to be able to see what it is that you've got. Um, the problems associated with this are these. Hard drives will fail. I guarantee you 100% without equivocation, hard drives will fail. When? When? Everybody wants to know. It's that when I pull off my watch and say, hey, you now. <coughs> Solid state memory devices can leak information through poor insulation. Cell phones are going to break. And you might say, well, ha <laughs> ha. Fear not, I've got it backed up on CD or Blu-ray or DVD. No, you don't. You are ignoring a couple of important things, one of them being bit hot. The average lifespan of a CDD or a CD uh, or a DVD is between six and ten years before it starts to deteriorate. What you are also not paying attention to is changes technology. Who remembers this? Who remembers when floppy disks were actually floppy? Dead technology. The CD is also dead technology. It just hasn't fallen over. So the solution is to back up your files. Back them up, back them up, back them up, back them up. I take that seriously and so should you. If you don't, you're going to lose your stuff. Follow the rule of three. Back your files up on three different kinds of social or on, uh, on uh, kinds of media. Make sure one of them is remote. And for the really important ones, make sure that you have a print of it that you can actually open. Uh, we're, this is the last section here where we have a brief gallery of images related to it. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I bought a bunch of material related to this, uh, reportedly related to a family from Oakmont. The only image, the only information I have at, of them is that they might be called Beck. The name of the family might be Beck. Does that really mean anything like This is a photograph of Bertie E.C. Beck. There are many photographs of her in this series from the time when she was a child. There are also two photographs of uh, of brother and sister, uh, father, uh, remember father Lawrence Beck and his sister, sister Agatha Beck. Uh, there is also a photograph of two cross-dressed men. Uh, as you can see, this, despite the fact that they don the dresses and they don the odd hats and, and pack their blouses, didn't think it was uh, didn't think it was important enough to change out of their pants and shoes. <laughs> this photograph was taken at the Brown Studio in Verona, PA. Uh, two anonymous Captain Card portraits by B. L. H. Dad is probably the most prominent photographer in Pittsburgh in this era. Bicycle cabinets and anonymous portraits. These are these recent additions to the collection by that's it. <laughs> 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 not been, been 
thank you all for showing. Uh, I have a number of examples up here if anybody's interested in looking at examples of the flesh and everything. All right, thank you, Jim. Very informative and educational. Thank you. Uh, before we go, we have. Uh, <coughs>